seen. I want to begin at verse 31 and cease at verse number 35. When you have it, I believe you can say amen. If you are a believer of God's word, you can say amen again. And if you're ready to read, say praise the Lord. All right, I like that. Yeah, you may stand to your feet for it is the word of God. John 13, 35, I'm going to read orally as you read along silently. Here is what's recorded in the King James Version of the Bible. It says, therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. Little children, yet a little while am I with you. You shall seek me. And as I said unto the Jews, whether I go, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another amen is that what you find in your bible look to your neighbor and say neighbor, neighbor. what do you know of love you may be seated this morning i want to speak to you with this thought in mind for our lesson it is simply entitled love made me do it Love made me do it. Uh, let me ask a question here. Uh, uh, has anybody ever been in love? Uh, I, I'm talking about real love. Uh, uh, somebody used to sing a song say, love will make you do wrong. Uh, I ain't talking about that wrong kind of love. I'm talking about the right kind of love. Uh, I'm not talking about that me and Mrs. Jones kind of love. I'm talking about that right kind of love. I'm talking about that, that cloud nine, as they call it, uh, kind of love, right? Have you ever really, truly been in love? In love with a person? In love with an idea? In love with a career? In love with, uh, you know, uh, just life? Have you ever really been in love? I, I, I'm fully convinced that today, that, that people take for granted this love, L-O-V-E. You know, I'm reminded uh, of a song that used to say it's a thin line between, oh, man, we got some real folk in the house I see here. Uh, somebody said it's a thin line between love and, and hate. And now that's interesting uh, that, that that would be said because that's pretty much what I, what I want to talk to you about this morning is I want to talk to you about uh, the love that God has and the hate that the devil has. Lord, have mercy. And, and I want to show you it showed up is a thin line between love and hate. Love made me do it. In John chapter 3 and verse number 16, you know this very well. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. I want you to understand, if you don't get nothing else out of this sermon, I want you to understand this. God is in love with you. God loves you. God loves you. Before we get into God's structure, God's order, God's church, before we get into any of that this morning, you just need to know right where you are that God loves you. So since God loves you, how important is this word, this L-O-V-E? Huh? Wasn't that King Cole that said L is for the way you look at me? O is for the only one I see? Uh, what is it uh, that is so significant when it comes uh, to love 
that the Bible itself, the, the greatest theme in the Bible, if you miss it, you miss the whole book because everything in the Bible is built on the foundation of love. Sometimes we can learn so much scripture, we can quote it, we can tote it, and we can choke on the verses. But trying to turn the verse into a loving action, that's hard, isn't it? Trying to love somebody that don't seem like they're treating you like they love you, uh, that, that's some work, isn't it? Come on, do, do I have some real folk in the house? Huh? Uh, I'm talking about the real folk. Uh, you know, y'all seen reality TV. I'm talking about the real folks. Know that love is not simple. It is one of the most challenging things to do in all of the book of the Bible. And do you know why that is? It's because all of us have shortcomings. And my shortcoming might get on your nerve. And, and your shortcoming might get on my nerve. And as a result of your shortcoming getting on my nerve and my shortcoming getting on your nerve, we both are coming short of God's love. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and come what? Short of the glory of God. It is because of sin. What is sin? It's missing the mark. What is sin? It's transgression against the law of God. What is sin? It's man's inability to handle his own choices, to do what he should consistently without interruption. That's what sin is. Man has a problem. Man has a problem doing what he should consistently regardless of how he feels. And so the love that we talk about today is not eros. That's romantic love. The love that we talk about today is not necessarily Philadelphia love. It is inclusive in that. But the love we want to talk about today is called agape love. Agape love is a love. No matter what you do, no matter what you say, it is certainly a crazy love. I, I want you to learn this morning to take from this message that in order to really love people the way God teaches, you're going to have to let somebody call you crazy because they're just not going to understand it. How in the world could Jesus love some folk that, that spat in his face, lied on him, brought him to Pilate, mocked him, chose a thief over him and then they hung him up there with some others and then they crucified him now i want you to get before we look at these verses here i want you to get that jesus was a different kind of man jesus could take a slapping do you, do you hear me that's why he could teach it if someone slaps you on one side of the cheek the bible says what I'm still looking for the brother that can do that. I'm, I'm still trying to find him. I, I can't even find him in the mirror. <laughs> we all in prayer on that one, right? <laughs> the Bible has some strong teachings in it. But Jesus was that kind of man. You could whip him. And he didn't lose his love. You could spit in his face. And he didn't lose his love. You could talk about him, scandalize his name, backstab him. And he didn't lose his, you could go to sleep on him in his crisis. How many of y'all got a friend like that? <laughs> and Jesus will still talk to you. Lord have mercy. It's a different kind of love altogether. And the only way we can get it, brothers and sisters, the only way we can get it is we got to let God teach us this. This, this. this ain't natural. No, it's not natural for me. If somebody knocked my tooth out, for me not to want to knock their tooth out. See? Uh, somebody said, uh, eye for eye, tooth for a tooth. But if we did that, it wouldn't take but two blows and we're blind and toothless. You hit me once, I hit you once. You hit me one more time and we're both blind. So that doesn't seem like a, a good way to live. Amen. The Bible says you live by the sword, you what? 
You die by the sword. So in John 13, Jesus does something crazy because he had a crazy kind of love. In the middle of teaching these 12 men that would become apostles, that would have all of this, uh, this responsibility and this authority in the church where the church is concerned, Jesus takes a moment to wash somebody's feet. Uh, he takes a moment to wash some stinky, dirty. See, y'all got to understand, back then they wore sandals. And they wore sandals in the Middle East. And they didn't have beauty salons to go to, ladies, and, and get the eggshells. They, they didn't have those. So Jesus was washing some very grimy, dirty feet. And he does this to teach them this great lesson of love. He does this to show them that no man, no matter what authority he's given, no one in the Lord's body of the church should be so or conceive of themselves as being so important and so high and so distinguished in society and, and, and have such a resume and have uh, such an articulation of the scriptures and the verbiage. And no one should allow themselves to get to the point to where they can't humble themselves and tend to the needs of their brothers and sisters in Christ. So Jesus washed feet. Peter was confused by it. Wait a minute. You, you the Lord. What you, wait. Lord, you're not washing my feet. Jesus basically says, if I don't wash your feet, you're on your own. Okay, then wash my feet, my hands, my head, everything. And so in John 13, well, we start in verse 31. We're talking about that thin line between love and hate. Here's what happens. Judas, Judas. No, you know, nobody wants that name, right? Anybody ever named their child Judas? <laughs> Would you want your daughter to marry a Judas? Boy, he really messed that name up. Uh, I don't know nobody that wants to name their child Judas or be called a Judas. Uh, but this Judas, this Judas was sitting at the table. He was the treasurer. He was handling the money. Mm. And uh, this Judas would betray Jesus. Now I've set the tone for where we're going to start our reading. This Judas would betray Jesus. The question is why? Why would you betray somebody who's going around doing good? Why would you set somebody up who's only taught you about God, who's been a great example to you, who has loved you? Why would you do it? I believe Romans 3.23 says, sin. As God told Cain, sin lieth at the door. So in John 13, 35, I want you to see this crazy love that Jesus shows. And then this crazy theology of love that he has. And then he's crazy enough to give a crazy commandment. So he demonstrates a crazy love by watch, washing dirty feet. And then... Uh, Jesus then expresses this crazy love in a theology. Lord have mercy. And then Jesus gives a commandment that is really, really crazy if you look at it. But it's all so right. Sounds crazy, but it's all so right. Verse 31 says, therefore, when he was gone out, talking about Judas, this is after Jesus had called him out. Said, what you do, do it quickly. Jesus didn't even tell, it, tell everybody, hey, stop Judas. No, he just said, yeah, the one who's going to betray me, that's him. What you do, do it quickly. And then verse 31 says, therefore, when he was going out, Jesus said, now is the son of man, what? And God is what? Glorified in him. Now, that word glorified is interesting. Here comes this crazy theology. That word glorified comes from an original Greek word which uh, says that Jesus is expressing, now has my life found its full meaning and value. Wait, wait, wait a minute, Jesus. What? What just happened to you? Judas is going to betray me. And you know it, guess. 
Now am I valued the most. Well, now that sounds crazy. How in the world can you be valued the most and you're about to get crucified? Jesus said, now, at this moment, now that the betrayer is unleashed to go and betray me, Jesus said, this is my moment to shine. Say, this real Christian teaching right here. Nobody don't like this. <laughs> this that true Christian teaching. I believe Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. That, that's that real Christian teaching. So this crazy Jesus, we might think, says, now, what has happened? Judas just walked out the room. Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified. And God is glorified in him. This is the very moment that I was born to come into. At this very moment, now does God receive the glory. How does God receive the glory, Jesus? Because someone has done me wrong when I have lived right. And he says, now God will get the glory. God will be magnified because of what is happening. In verse 32 he says, if God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself and shall straightway or immediately glorify him. And then he goes on to say, little children, yet a little while am I with you. You shall seek me. And as I said unto the Jews, whether I go, you cannot come. So now I say to you, let's pause there. What has happened? Jesus is just being betrayed. He knows he's going to be betrayed. Judas, he allowed Judas to leave the room. He not only allowed Judas to leave the room, he said, whatever you're going to do, do it quickly. Do it quickly. Don't, don't, you know what? Don't be slothful in business. Go ahead and do what you're going to do and do it quickly. And those of you that remember the story, you know that Jesus was betrayed with a kiss. Why was he betrayed with a kiss? Because it's a thin line between love and hate. Just look at some of the relationships we've been in. And we thought we were so in love. And we were singing the Jackson 5 songs. So in love. Singing the ABCs of it, right? And the one, two, threes. And all of a sudden, something happens. The love we thought we had. The love we thought was present, we discover, is not as we hoped. We discover friends or fair weather friends. We discover family sometimes, our fair weather family members. We discover that the devil is able to work in the hearts of even some of our closest relationships. Jesus experiences this. And Jesus says, what you do, do it quickly. The whole purpose of my being here, don't forget this. This was Jesus talking. This was the body of Jesus Christ. And he says, my whole purpose for being here is glorifying God. It's not about me. Because I could respond to this situation a whole lot of ways. I could say, Judas, meet me outside, homie. You're going to have to make it to them before you, I just let you turn me into the law. You know how we would act. We would lift up that table and say, well, God, I, I, I know that's what you said, God, but wait a minute. I, I can't just let this guy come up in here and, and go betray me like this. If it were us, we would have intervened instead of letting what God wants to happen happen. Why? Because it's hard for us. But Jesus showed his submission. No wonder the Bible says, obedient unto death. Jesus showed. It ain't about the light. It ain't about everybody saying Hosanna all the time. It's not about the roses and the flowers. It's not about people saying, hail Jesus. It's not about all of that. Sometimes this responsibility of living the way God wants me to live is going to require me to go through some things, to be backstabbed, to be lied on, to be talked about, to be criticized. And Jesus said, it's at that moment 
where not you or I, but God is glorified. And then Jesus goes on to say, into this teaching, a what? A new commandment. Don't miss this. Love made me do it. Jesus, why would you let Judas leave that table? Love. This man don't have no love for you, but I got love for him. Jesus, why would you get up there on that cross and hang for the whole nine hours? Love. But these folk don't act like they love you, but I love them. That's why I can say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. This is Jesus' love. And it is a crazy kind of love. Right? So then Jesus says, after he makes mention that God is now glorified, he says, I'm going to give you something. What are you going to give us, Jesus? A command. Wait, wait a minute, Jesus. Now, you... You just got through saying you were glorified and you just got through washing feet and showing us that we should follow the example of our master. And if he has served, then we should serve. And what are you doing? I'm giving you a commandment. Why does Jesus give a commandment? Could it be because God knows we might not want to do it? Could it be that God knows, which he does, he's omniscient, he knows everything. He's been there before we get to that moment. He's already been there. God can see how we will respond to anything. And in the mind of God, God chose to put in the mouth of Jesus as the manifested flesh of God, God chose to put in him a new commandment. He said, a command, I'm going to command something out of you. A new commandment. That means you can't get this from the Old Testament. You got to go to the new. He said, a new commandment I'm going to give to you. How many of you know a commandment means you got to do it? A commandment means you don't have a choice if you're going to be right with God. All right, Christ, what is the commandment? A new commandment I give to you that you what? Love one another. That's, that's the command and then Jesus didn't even stop. Then he tells us how. How do you want us to love one another Jesus? As don't do it like you do it. No, 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 because your, your love ain't the kind of love I'm looking for. Don't do it like mama does it. That ain't the kind of love I'm looking for. Don't do it like cousin or brother. Don't do it like them. Jesus said do it like me. Uh, you heard the saying, be like Mike. He said, be like Christ. Do it the way I do it. Love folk the way I love them. Treat folk the way I treat them. Serve folk the way I serve them. I want you to do this like I do it. Do love like me. Read from the manual of how Jesus does it. And what would Jesus do? And I want you to do it this way. Why would Jesus say that? Why would Jesus do that? Because he knows it's a thin line between love and hate. When we as humans come short and hurt one another, we have to overcome with love. When life brings us tests that we don't understand, we have to overcome with love. When the spouse isn't quite acting right or saying the right things, making mistakes, and just seem like they're having a hard time, we've got to overcome it with love. When the children just won't act right and can't get themselves together, we have to overcome it with love. Why? Because in the mind of God, love is what prompted him to save the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him should not perish. You don't have to perish. You don't have to ever die. If you know how to believe in Jesus. That's the question I want to ask you this morning. Do you know how to believe in Jesus? Some folk think that believing in Jesus is just saying, yeah, I believe that he came, and that's that. I want you to know this morning that the Bible teaches a belief that 
follows by obedience. A responsive belief. John would say a belief that's put into action. John would say a belief that follows commands. Do you believe in Jesus like that? Are you ready to embrace him? He says, a new commandment I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Why is that so important, Jesus? Why is love so important? Why can't I just quote a bunch of scripture to folk? Uh, that, that's not going to do it. That's not gonna, why, why, why can't I just tell folk what they need to change about themselves? Because they, need, they got so many issues they need to change, and they need to change these things. And then I got all these issues. that I need, why, why, why can't I just do that? Because that's not going to fix and solve anything. Transformation, when we talk about the gospel power, is rooted in love. So what do you say when someone says, what did you do to become a Christian? In Romans 10, in verse number 17, the Bible says, so then faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. The question is, what have you heard? You've heard a lot of things about love. All these love songs, they all teach certain things about love. But they're not teaching love like Jesus love. The only place you're going to find love like Jesus love is in the Holy Bible. And Jesus' message to you today is if you're not a member of the Church of Christ, that you need to become a member. You need to know what it feels like to really be loved. You need to know what it feels like to be loved unconditionally because we like to say that we do it, but the truth is we struggle with it. Only Jesus can love you in your mess and help you come out of it. Only Jesus can bless you and move you past your burdens. Only Jesus can do that. And he's been loving you the whole time. And what does Jesus want? He wants you to come to Jesus. He wants you to give your life. He wants you to stop playing with him. He wants you to understand that he loves you and come into his family. And so God sent him down here not to condemn the world, but to save folk. Save who? Whosoever will. Willing to do what? Follow and obey and respond. You can't come to Jesus and not respond. You have to be willing to come forward. Have you willing to give your life to Christ? How? By hearing the gospel message, understanding that Jesus suffered, bled, and died for your sins and mine. But thank God he did not stay dead. Amen? Amen. Everybody stand on your feet. Stand on your feet. Stand on your feet. Why would someone come into a world full of folk that's got issues and problems, full of people that have inherited the devil's spirit, behave in devilish ways, that continue to repeat habitual sins, that struggle day and night, that create problems in the world and dysfunctions in the family. Why would Jesus come? How does any of it make sense? It only makes sense when you know what made God do. Love made him do it. He loves you. He doesn't want to see anybody perish, but he wants everybody to come to him the right way. How do you do it? You've heard the gospel message. If you believe it, you then are obligated to respond. How do I respond, Brother Garner? By coming down this aisle. If you know you're not in a right relationship with the Lord, you need to get that relationship right. You must be willing to repent of your sins. That's changing your mind and your behavior. I want, I want to break loyalty to sin. I want to pledge allegiance to the Lord. Repent. Confess Jesus Christ as Lord before men. Be baptized. Be baptized today. All your sins will be washed away. You'll be added to the church of Christ. Promises. Heaven will be your home if you can be faithful. And why? Was it because you did something so wonderful and so great? The answer is no, none of us have. But it's because God loves you. And since God loves you, I want to encourage you today as we sing the song of invitation, don't leave out of these doors with a half undone kind of love. With a love that's so thin it's closer to hate than love. Don't leave out of here and not have God as a part of your master plan. Because any plan that doesn't have God as its master 
is a plan that will fail. And today is unlike any other because God has provided the sunshine and the oxygen in your lungs to bring you to this day so that you might give your life to him. So if you're here at this time and you need to respond, this is your opportunity. If you're here and you need prayer, you need prayer for strength and for love, we ask you to come as we all together sing the song of the invitation at this time.